Hi, everyone, and welcome to PRISM's webinar, Self-Regulation, Our Greatest Parenting Tool. I am so excited to be here with all of you this evening. My name is Allison Stefanok, and I'll be your host tonight. I'm a PRISM's board member, and I'm also a mom to an incredible 11-year-old daughter diagnosed with SMS. This webinar is brought to you by PRISMS. PRISMS is an acronym for parents and researchers interested in smith mcginnis syndrome. PRISMS is an advocacy, education, and support organization for individuals with SMS, their families, and the professionals who serve them. The information contained in this webinar is intended for your general education and information. PRISMS webinars are not intended to, nor do they constitute medical or other advice. Viewers are warned not to take any action with regard to treatment based on this information without first consulting your physician. PRISMS does not promote, recommend, or treat, or recommend any treatment therapy or institution or healthcare plan. A recording of this webinar and all past webinars can be found on prisms.org under the education tab. If you, um, if you have any questions for our speaker this evening, you can type them into the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And at the end of the presentation, we'll take some time to answer as many questions as we can, although we may not get to all of them. So our topic for this evening is self-regulation as a parenting tool with, um, for children with challenging behaviors with speaker Eileen Devine. Eileen is a returning speaker for PRISMS. She has a wonderful session from um, our virtual summit, so be sure to check that out if you haven't already. Uh, Eileen has over a dozen years of clinical experience. She's also the mother of a child with significant brain-based differences and challenging behavioral symptoms. She believes that kids do well if they can, and that when we understand the way a child's brain works, then we understand the meaning behind the behaviors. So thank you so much, Eileen, for being with us this evening. I've really been forward, uh, looking forward to this presentation, and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's so good to be back with all of you. Um, we are going to be talking about co-regulation tonight, and this is something that has made a significant difference in my own parenting of my child who has brain-based differences. As was mentioned, she's 13 and a very fragile nervous system. So we'll get into all of that and what it means. I want to begin by just acknowledging that flipping your lid when someone else is flipping theirs is totally, completely normal, expected. And frankly, it's just how we humans work. So emotional contagion, those emotions being contagious is real. And when we have individuals in our home who are flipping their lids often, no fault of their own, right? Due to their fragile nervous system, the way that their brain works differently, it makes sense that we would join them despite our best efforts. It, this is all about our nervous systems communicating with one another. So I want to just begin with that because I know that a lot of parents that I work with, they're amazing and they have a lot of, oh, I should be able to get a hold of it. I shouldn't flip my lids off. I shouldn't be so frustrated. I should know better by now. Um, it's just us being human, right? So we're gonna talk about what I mean when I say our nervous systems are communicating and why it matters in our parenting experience and especially your very unique parenting experience and really what it means for our human experience. Um, I know that this is hard on you, right? When you have, um, when you're at the mercy of somebody else's nervous system um, and I don't know about you, but when this is, uh, when this happens, when I flip my lid because the emotional contagion is there in my household. Um, it's when my not so finest parenting moments have occurred. So while I'm human, of course, and I recognize that about myself, I practice lots of grace and self-compassion as much as I can. Um, I'd rather not go there to that dysregulated place <laughs> with the dysregulated individuals in my home if I don't have to. Um, but if there was a magic cure all to this, then uh, we wouldn't be here, right? We wouldn't be learning about what this means and the steps that we can take to um, protect against it. Uh, we would know all of that already. Um, while there isn't a magic solution though, there are things that with time, 
really, really help with all of the pieces we're going to be talking about tonight. So that's what we will begin. We'll begin talking about co-regulation, regulation, connection to our nervous system, and how when we can strengthen our nervous system and really understand what's going on at that physiological level, it helps us use that to our advantage in parenting our kids who have very fragile nervous systems. So another piece that I just wanna be mindful of kind of um, setting this, this groundwork that not one of us comes into parenthood as blank slates, okay? So we all have our histories, the way that we develop, the way the co-regulation we were provided growing up, the way we were parented, our deeply held beliefs and values, how they might clash with um, the behaviors that our child has. So be gentle with yourself. Your history matters. Um, again, you are just human trying to do the best you can. Practice lots of self-compassion because what you're doing is really, really hard. Hopefully the information tonight and the perspective um, that I hope to provide you on what's happening again at that nervous system level will help you have that perspective, which always helps us take a little step back and not have so much reactivity in these really, really challenging moments. So the need for connection is a biological imperative, and that happens at a physiological level. So whether you are an introvert, extrovert, it does not matter. Um, connection, connecting with others at this deeper physiological level is a biological imperative. So every human being is looking to be seen and known in this way. Everyone is looking, um, every one of us is looking to have our energy matched. We're looking for a mirror, that mirror being another person to reflect what we are feeling. So some of this takes place at a conscious level, feeling, if you're feeling lonely or isolated um, and having the company of another person, for example, but there is a deep physiological experience of connection that we have to have in our life in order to survive. And so that's what we will be talking about tonight. Co-regulation, understanding co-regulation is the first and uh, most important step in knowing what to do, how to use this idea of co-regulation, regulation, nervous system stability in our parenting. What we typically do when our kids are having a hard time is we get more activated. So we talk louder and faster, we reach for our power, we try to force different behaviors, uh, we are doing anything we can to just make that behavior stop. Um, we want to uh, sure we want to be sure to address it to make sure that they know that it's not okay, um, that they're not getting away with anything, that they're that that has had an impact on us. That is a behavioral lens approach, assuming that the behavior that we're seeing is within their control and is intentional. But what if it isn't? What if it's actually about their fragile and sensitive nervous system needing more support in that moment. I'm going to suggest um, that your first and primary focus in challenging situations is actually to step away from that behavioral lens and looking at that behavior as willful intentional defiance using behavior, traditional behavior modification techniques to take a step away from that perspective and actually not focus on the behaviors at all, but instead focus first on checking in with yourself, your own regulated state, and we'll get into that here in detail in a moment, and then focusing on first and foremost, providing your child with co-regulation. So what is regulation? What do I mean when I'm talking about our self-regulation? Regulation is all about being in balance, um, it, of course, applies to things beyond parenting, but when we are talking about regulation in relationship to parenting, we're talking about our autonomic nervous system. Our autonomic nervous system is largely an unconscious system. It regulates bodily functions such as heart rate, digestion, respiratory rate, and more. It's also the primary mechanism for fight or flight response. So if you think about in a situation where um, you are growing anxious, there's some sort of anxiety involved or overwhelm, you have a lot of these things happening, these bodily functions, heart rate, digestion, respiratory rate will change in one way or another, giving you some sort of indication, your body's giving you feedback that that's happening. That's what we mean by that fight or flight response. A strong, healthy nervous system 
has a greater ability to remain regulated during challenging situations. This is what's referred to as self-regulation, okay? So we all have a fight or flight response that gets activated, some more than others, based on your history, if you've experienced trauma in your life, the amount of co-regulation or nervous system support from a regulated adult that you receive in your life currently or that you did growing up. Another way to think about um, our fight or flight response is our internal physiological sense of being safe or not safe, right? So we're all going to be at different places on that self-regulation spectrum. And this is not about giving ourselves a grade or saying, oh, I'm doing so bad with my self-regulation. That's not at all what this is about. It's about understanding how this is at play for you. It's at play in some way for each one of us and what it means then um, to the to the parenting and um, the way that you interact with your child who has a very fragile nervous system. Another way to think about this concept of regulation and self-regulation is this accelerator and this brake. So stress is the accelerator. Stress can impact the brain in very good ways. It's not always a bad thing. So for example, exercise is an accelerator. It impacts our brain function in really good ways. It can clear our head, lift our mood, that sort of thing. Um, but stress can also, of course, be distressing, especially if it is constant and in large amounts. So I want you to think about kind of your current life, how it is right now, um, how it feels to you in terms of this accelerator and this break. So in typical brains, what society would consider neurotypical, typically developed brains, there is a, an accelerator, but then there's also a break that's working really well in harmony with that accelerator. And so you get the stress, you have this accelerator, but you have this break that can come in and kind of help balance things out, right? So self-coping skills, strategies, even just self-talk, or even just your internal state can do that sometimes without you even knowing that that's happening. In dysregulated brains, brains that are under a lot of stress or brains that have been changed in function and structure for some reason, have a more exaggerated accelerator and they don't have a break that's working as well as we would expect it to. So there's this huge response from the accelerator and the break isn't there to kind of balance things out. So things like self-soothing, being able to calm, being able to find kind of that grounded state is much, much more difficult. What happens when there's this over um, active accelerator is that tiny amounts of stress start to provoke large responses. So I want you to think about this in a few ways. Um, I would imagine that many of you are under a great deal of daily stress, like many of the parents that I work with who are parenting kids with extraordinary needs. And so that amount of stress builds, builds, builds over time. So your window of tolerance for being able to manage stressful situations might have narrowed over time. That is really just a result of the situation that you are in. It's not any fault of your own. What that means is that small things that smallish, smaller things that happen that wouldn't have thrown you for a loop before may now throw you out of your window of tolerance, right? Having a large response that you wouldn't have necessarily had um, before being in the stressful, prolonged stressful situation. Same can be said for kids who have brain-based differences of some kind, no matter the, the cause for those differences. Um, their fragile nervous systems, because of that development, have a small window of tolerance. So that's why we see this with our kids a lot too. Small stressors, large responses, where we're saying, why did, what caused that response? It was not that big of a deal, right? In the brain's attempt to calm self, cortisol is released, but too much cortisol imp impedes the thinking brain. And so when we need our thinking brain online the most <laughs> to deal with the stressful situation, it's we're out of our window of tolerance and our thinking brain is offline. And it impairs our ability to think, <laughs> to use those cognitive skills, right? Same is true for our kids, but we're talking about our ability to stay regulated right now. So no wonder that if you consider yourself to be somebody who has been impacted by a lot of stress, prolonged toxic stress that's gone um, untreated, you um, have not found the support that maybe you need to work through that, there is going to be this cumulative effect of this over 
active accelerator, a break that's not working as well, window of tolerance narrowing. So out of window of tolerance for small stressors that maybe wouldn't have done that before, thinking brain offline, right? So just giving some context of what regulated, dysregulated looks like. Emotional regulation and our window of tolerance. I've already talked about the narrow window of tolerance, right? That can be the result of lots of different things that impact the brain. A stressed brain that has a more narrow window of tolerance becomes dysregulated more easily out of your thinking brain when that happens. In order to come back into the thinking brain to really find your steady ground again, to feel like, okay, I can move forward and think and make decisions, we have to be regulated first. And then we have to be relating to the person that we are interacting with with that situation in order to reason. Okay, to use those higher level thinking. So thinking about this in relationship to your parenting experience and your role as parenting, again, if you're under a lot of prolonged stress, what that might look like for you, or if you're in a parenting partnership, what is this, um, does any of this resonate with you in terms of how your partner may be experiencing things right now? And then also for your child, right? When they are not regulated, they cannot reason, right? And so many times when they're out of their thinking brain, they're out of their window of tolerance, that's when the escalated behaviors happen. We see that through challenging behaviors. And if you're like me, <laughs> when I'm not in my thinking brain remembering this, I launch into lecturing, talking, trying to reason. <laughs> Why did you do that, right? Those sorts of things. Well, my daughter who has this fragile nervous system, she can't reason with me. She can't sit and listen. She can't follow my directions. She can't call my call or um, turn when I call her name. Even those simple cognitive tasks are out of the realm of possibility for her because her thinking brain is offline, okay? So that's why I say co-regulation and helping our kids regulate is our greatest parenting tool. It helps them come back into their window of tolerance so then we can move on in the ways that we want to as a parent, teaching them right from wrong, instilling our values, having conversations with them, giving them that type of support. But in order to help them come into their window of tolerance, we need to be regulated to do that, okay? So another layer of this is neuroception. Dr. Stephen Porges, I'm gonna give you lots of resources um, where you can find more information about his work if you'd like. He is the, um, he's the author of this idea, I guess you'd say. Neuroception is the automatic and subconscious detection of threat, determining how safe or unsafe we are in relation to a person or a situation. So neuroception explains why a baby coos at a caregiver but cries at a stranger, or why a toddler enjoys a parent's embrace um, but views a hug from a stranger as an assault. Neural, neural circuits distinguish whether um, situations or people are safe or dangerous or life-threatening. And Dr. Porges writes, because of our heritage as a species, neuroception takes place in the primitive parts of the brain without our conscious awareness. The detection of a person as safe or dangerous triggers neurobiologically determined pro-social and defensive behaviors. So we're not aware of this happening at um, a conscious level. It's all happening at a subconscious level. So even though we may not be aware of a danger on a cognitive level, at a neurophysiological level, our body has already started a sequence of neural processes that would facilitate adaptive defensive behavior such as fight, flight, or freeze. So in other words, neuroception is our autonomic nervous system's response to real or perceived threats or safety. Now, what happens when you have um, a brain that has been impacted again by chronic stress, or you are parenting a child whose brain has been changed for one reason or another. Well, there can be what's called faulty neuroception. When neuroception is faulty, a person shifts involuntarily into this defensive position. It leads to reactive or challenging behaviors. It's a clear reflection of their stressed, fragile nervous system, that fight or flight response. 
So there's all different reasons why somebody can experience faulty neuroception. Their nervous system is telling them that they're in danger. Their reactions to situations may seem inappropriate or extreme. Their window of tolerance um, of the nervous system becomes like hair trigger um, sensitive. Any little thing that can cause their can cause their nervous system to fire danger. And so that means as a result of that, what that can look like is this explosiveness that comes out of nowhere, other in the ho- others in the house walking on eggshells around them. So an adult, for example, with a low voice may just be a, an adult with a low voice <laughs> to you, but with your child, their nervous system could interpret that lower vibration of that voice as a threat and get really agitated or angry for what may seem like no, um, no, whoops, let me get it here. Sorry about that. Um, for no reason at all. So why does this matter? Why does it matter? Why do we need to know about what our nervous system is communicating, what it is doing, the faulty neuroception, what is neuroception versus faulty neuroception? There's been a lot of research that's been done on this topic. Here's the two two main researchers. Again, I'm gonna give you their resources at the end of this so that you can dive into this deeper if it's resonating with you. Dr. Mona De La Hook, she talks about neuroception being the single most unifying concept to guide the treatment of children across all environments, parenting, early intervention, education, and mental health. And again, she's not talking about only kids who have brain-based differences, only kids who have fragile nervous systems, all kids, right? But it certainly applies um, in very specific ways, exaggerated ways maybe, um, for kids who have brain-based differences. Neuroception is believed to be at the root of many diagnoses, such as PTSD, ODD, autism, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, ADHD, sensory processing disorders, RAD, and depression. So again, lots of context to help us understand why we might see these challenging behaviors. And if faulty neuroception, if dysregulation is at the root of challenging behaviors, if that's what's behind challenging behaviors, then how do we as parents understand that so that we can um, buffer against that? Well, that is what co-regulation is. So when our nervous systems are out of balance, we get stuck in that survival physiology, right? We can think of it as the accelerator going and no break in sight. We can think of it as being outside of our window of tolerance. Um, whatever piece of that makes the most sense to you or resonates the most resonates with you the most, that is basically being in that fight or flight um, phys- physiological state. Our nervous systems are communicating with one another, having this complex dialogue all the time. So sending messages about whether we're safe or not safe in the presence of that other person, that's the neuroception piece. It is not a conscious thought. It's just happening whether we want it to or not. Co-regulation means that we can be a buffer influence or a triggering influence for another individual, for those around us, depending on the stability and state of our nervous system. If we are regulated, we have the ability, the opportunity to be a buffer influence to somebody who is dysregulated and help them come into a regulated state. Um, If we are dysregulated, which we are going to be (laughs) at different points in our life because we are human, then unfortunately, that means we will be a triggering influence. That's that emotional contagion, right? So as much as we would love, I'm sure, to all be buffers, (laughs) it's just not possible, okay? So um, we are going to be triggering in some way at some point. The goal is not to be perfect. That is just not attainable. The goal is to understand, again, where you might be right now on that continuum of regulated state or not, and understand what that means for the way that you experience the world and the way that it might impact those around you, and then what you can do to strengthen your nervous system to be more regulated more of the time. That is really the goal. Um, regulation, regulated does not always mean calm, but it does mean safe. So what I mean by that is that if you have a child who's like really, really amped up, really dysregulated out of their body, out of their thinking brain, many parents think that to be regulated and help them co-regulate and come back down, it's to get softer 
and to get quieter and to get smaller. And that could be what's needed at some points, but most of the time, if a child is really agitated, really up here, we need to meet that energy level. So not in yelling, screaming, <laughs> getting agitated, not meeting them that way, of course, but meeting them kind of in that force of energy, mirroring that to them so that our nervous systems can catch on to each other. That's the way I think about it. And then you can help them come down. So we are pulled to mirror the energy of the inner of the individual we're interacting with. The work is not to get caught up in that and instead to learn ways to downregulate our nervous system so we can support our child in this case and their fragile nervous systems. So the next question, how do I know if I'm regulated, right? So here are some indications of um, moving into dysregulation. If you are not able to stay in the present moment. Um, so if you are future tripping, like, oh my goodness, if this today, what about tomorrow? What about next week? What about when my child's an adult? Oh my gosh, how am I ever gonna do this? How am I gonna do this for that much longer? Really, really understandable place to go, okay? Um, the work is to not shame and blame ourselves for doing that, but instead to recognize it and understand that that is going to dysregulate us, right? How do we stay in the present more of the time? Staying grounded, so anchored in the here and now, connected to ourselves, so awareness of what's happening in our body. How does your nervous system communicate to you that it's starting to get dysregulated? Our body tells us first, many of us are very disconnected from our body until we start to really practice paying attention, recognizing our thoughts. Our thoughts are very powerful, understanding how that can send us into dysregulation, staying connected to the child in our presence. So that is again, going up to the anchored in the here and now it's related to that. So I have worked with parents who their child's behaviors are so um, distressing, so challenging that they will disassociate they will literally leave their bodies mentally and check out. And that is their body going flight, right? When we talk about fight or flight, that's their body saying, this, their nervous system saying, you are not safe in this person's presence, get the heck out of here, right? And so that you're going against your, your very human protective patterns in order to stay anchored in the here and now, in order to stay connected to your child who's having a really difficult time in your presence tolerating the intensity of that moment. So staying within our window of tolerance, what kind of things can we do to stay within the window of tolerance? Using mantras, bringing visuals are very powerful, bringing to mind somebody who um, helps you calm and stay grounded, right? Um, mantras like stay soft, that's mine. <laughs> stay soft, Eileen, stay soft. And that means for me, stay soft in facial expressions, in tone of voice and in body posture right? Because that can, our kids are so sensitive to those things, of course, and that can cause more dysregulation. Um, it helps me just kind of downregulate a bit, right? Using our breathing. Breathing is totally underestimated in terms of being able to stay regulated. So tolerating the intensity of the moment is um, about understanding it is as hard as you think it is. It is as hard as you think it is in that moment. Like, man, this is hard, right? And also, what can I do, right? To make it through um, in this more regulated state and not lose it, whatever that might look like for you. So what does this mean for your parenting? We talked about a fragile nervous system being behind challenging behaviors that we see in kids with brain-based differences. That's another mantra that's really helpful for me is um, when I can see that my daughter is experiencing dysregulation, um, saying to myself, this is her fragile nervous system showing itself to me. Just even that can kind of take some of my reactivity out, right? Help me kind of settle in. What is needed most in these challenging moments are gentle boundaries with co-regulation, which provides support and healing to their nervous system. So again, what we all thought parenting would be. <laughs> and if you have neurotypical children, this might be what it is for them. Um, I have a neurotypical son who's 14. And when something happens, I say, hey, let's sit down and talk about it, right? We can do that in that moment. He doesn't become dysregulated. 
he has the cognitive skills to tolerate the distress that he's feeling or the stress he's feeling about having that conversation with me about what he did that wasn't okay. Um, not, it's not the same with my daughter. So I know that what I need to do first when there's these challenging situations is to be sure that I am helping her stay regulated so that we can then move on into those other things, right? Um, when that co-regulation is provided consistently over the long term, self-regulation is developed, but it takes a long, long time. Okay? And I wish it was overnight. I wish it was a quick fix, um, but you do see it starts to see the fruits of your labor. Self-regulation is developed inside of attachment and connection. So of course, without attachment, without connection to your child, self-regulation cannot take place. So maybe that's where some folks need to begin. It is a very active process on the parent's part. Um, for some of you, you may be feeling that <laughs> if you feel a little heavy with what I'm suggesting. I have had parents though that say, are you sure? Like that's all you want me to focus on because that behavioral lens looms so large in our society, right? You don't want me to be more active, like giving a consequence, sending them to their room, you know, whatever, taking away things that they like to do. It's like, nope, just for the next week, when your child is experiencing really challenging behavioral symptoms, again, symptoms, right? That's a shift. Then let's focus on what you can do to re maintain regulated state yourself and then focus on co-regulation and connection with your child. Let's just focus on that for the next week. When I talked about parents um, coming, not coming into parenthood as blank slates, one of the things to just recognize and think about for yourself is um, we were not born with the ability to self-regulate. That came through co-regulated support from a regulated adult. Um, some folks did not have the advantage of growing up with a regulated primary caregiver in their home. That will have an impact on your ability to be regulated. And that is not to um, say it's not possible for you. It's actually quite the opposite. It's very possible. It's just to help you give context about why something might look so hard for you <laughs> when it looks like maybe it's not so hard for your partner or other people, right? That could be part of the reason as well. So this is another way to sort of look at it and talk about it. If you start in the top left-hand corner there, we have a child with a fragile nervous system. They need large doses of co-regulation. All of our kids need co-regulation. Our kids with fragile nervous systems need large, large doses of that to be just kind of grounded, stable throughout their day. The parent provides that co-regulation, but that is taxing to your nervous system. And so then we need to talk about building resilience to resort, restore the nervous system. When you do that, build that resilience, your ability to maintain your regulated state increases, and then you're able to go back and provide that co-regulated support mo more often, right? You're not falling into that being a triggering influence um, as much as you had before, right? It's not about perfection. Again, you are where you are, um, but it's about understanding now what this looks like and means for your parenting and what can you do to build your resilience, to restore your nervous system, to be able to be more regulated for a longer period of time. So here are some of the steps that you can take now um, to just kind of begin moving down this path. Seeing the challenge in behavior for what it is, right? That can help us. But again, this takes practice too, but taking that step back and reminding ourselves what actually is happening within our child's nervous system when we're seeing those challenging behaviors, focusing on our own regulation, that includes attention to body language, tension and facial expression, tone of voice, focusing on that connection and co-regulation first and primarily, and then moving into other things. Once you recognize that they're, they're in their window of tolerance, they're regulated. And then outside of these moments, the detective work to figure out where the faulty neuroception is getting triggered, um, what helps bring your child back to that place of safety, Again, we're talking about from a physiological um, standpoint, we're going to talk about that in just two more slides here, what we can do to help our kids 
get um, back into their window of tolerance. So some strategies, more strategies, our thoughts are para- powerful. Do you have a mantra in your back pocket? Like I talked about, just stay grounded. Another piece, I'm remembering these that I use for my daughter, um, when she needs to have that co-regulated support and it's very physical for her, like she wants to be um, squeezed and hugged and she wants to literally be fused <laughs> to my body. Um, and in those challenging moments, I don't always feel like having that level of closeness, <laughs> you know, everything in my being, in my nervous system is saying, create distance, create distance, right? So I have to talk myself through, lean into her, Eileen, lean into her. And that really is talking literally lean into her as she's grabbing onto me, but it's also leaning into her with this gentle way of seeing her with empathy, with compassion, right? Disengage and take a break if you can, right? Give yourself some break. Um, feel Not feeling like you have to take on that moment in that minute. Sometimes you do. I understand that risk is involved. There's something safety-wise going on, but if you can take a break, give yourself the break. Validating that you're human, you're doing the best you can, and this is hard, right? This is really hard parenting work. Practice self-compassion, remain curious, Um, visualization. I talked about that already and writing down strategies and plans ahead of time, having them up somewhere where you can see them in those moments. And maybe it's writing it in a way that only you understand what you're actually talking about there. If you feel like it's not something that um, you want the entire family unit (laughs) to kind of understand what's there, but having it up, say on your refrigerator, so that when you are out of your window of tolerance, your thinking brain is offline. You don't have to think so hard. You can look at that plan. This is what I do. This is how I cope. These are my strategies. In Dr. Mona De La Hook's book, Beyond Behaviors, again, I'm going to give you the full citation at the end. Um, she has some great ideas on how to help your child regulate and get to a point of safety, again, at this, in this nervous system um, perspective that we're talking about. Um, of course, you're going to hear it again. Focus on your own regulation. Prioritize connection mirroring your child's energy and not the dysregulation. So um, she talks about starting low and slow um, and being paying attention to your tone of voice, body posture, those sorts of things. Um, the other piece that I just want to mention is that uh, there is a collapsed state of dysregulation. So I have parents who describe their kids not acting out in the very disruptive ways that we think of dysregulation, like meltdowns, blowups, whatever it might be, things that are very disruptive, um, but they have more of a collapsed state where they literally can't get them out of bed or they just lie on the floor like a wet noodle and they're like, get up, come on, let's go, right? Our frustration get, can get triggered um, so easily from that because it looks like such intentional, willful defiance but that can be dysregulation. That can be their nervous system in a state of collapsed. Focus on sensory preferences that will help your child settle like a cold drink, food, a snack, pleasant smells, auditory preferences like music, being playful. Playfulness is definitely like a muscle. (laughs) So it gets stronger, um, but uh, if we don't use it, we can feel out of our element, right? For me, the more stressed I am, the weaker my play muscle gets. Um, But I know that playfulness helps keep a situation from escalating by keeping the nervous system open, right? And again, down-regulated. So if I can go back to that and muster up that playfulness, um, it works wonderfully, wonderfully with my my daughter. But um, just know that if some of these don't resonate with you and it feels like, oh, I've got to build this muscle, it's exactly what it is. And then less is often more. So less talking, right? Less movement, Um, understanding that you don't have to be as physically active like I talked about um, or active with your words, um, that sometimes having your presence there with as less of the talking of the motion um, can help um, our kids come back down and regulate. Okay, so I wanna talk really quickly about Um, nervous system stability, because as you'll see from just the pieces we've talked about so far, if we are going to provide co-regulation to our child who so desperately needs that from us, because it is a biological imperative, but on top of that, they have a fragile nervous system, 
um, that is, like I said, taxing to our nervous system, especially when we have a child who needs it so intensely. So we have to strengthen our nervous system. We, it, it's, it's not just an optional piece of our parenting paradigm, in my opinion. Our, our well being, our survival literally depends on us doing that. And we do that by building resilience. Um, the webinar that was mentioned earlier that I did um, for the virtual webinar last year, we go way um, deeper into this. So I would encourage you, if you haven't been able to see that one, to go back. It's completely um, tied in and, and directly related to everything that we're talking about tonight. Um, so just to do some ground setting with resilience, it's not a fixed characteristic. We can strengthen it over time um, with daily practice and attention. It of course becomes stronger with lifelong practice as many things do, but we have to do it, right? That's kind of the bummer, bummer piece of it. Um, a village of people around us make that easier, of course, but we have to do it. It is not about grit or soldiering on or just making it through, okay? That actually will, um, that will chip away at your resilience. Um, it's an insult to your nervous system to, to do that. Um, it's about feeling as though we have choices in the moment versus being in this cycle of reacting, reacting, reacting. It's about honoring our response to the situation at hand. So like I said before, um, being regulated means um, giving uh, validation to the experience that you're in. This is what resilience is too. It's meeting the demands of the moment, but also recognizing like, man, this is hard, right? Like this is awful. It is as hard as I think it is. I really wish I weren't in this situation right now. And also I know that I know what to do to keep it, to, to make it through it. I know that this will pass. I know I will get out on the other side just fine. Recognizing when we're overwhelmed and honoring the response, not beating ourselves up, not saying you shouldn't be overwhelmed. You should be able to do this. Um, saying like, yeah, I'm overwhelmed and this is overwhelming. That is resilience. Really quickly, a few of the pieces that I see with the parents that I work with and the research shows us what chips away at our resilience and really puts us in a position of having a nervous system that is then not as strong as it could be um, are a few things in this unique parenting experience. The first is recognizing our emotional experience and how it relates to this parenting, very unique parenting experience. Um, for many, it is um, not what they thought it would be. It's very stressful. There's grief, there's loss. Um, there is maybe trauma that's been involved. And so of course it is much easier most of the time to just ignore it and to deny it, right? But Brene Brown, who's done a lot of research on this topic, she has in her book, Rising Strong, the opposite of recognizing we're feeling something is to deny emotions. When we disengage from those tough emotions, they don't go away. Instead, they own us and they define us. So understanding how you respond to emotion, do you offload it onto other people? Do you retreat, <laughs> right? Do you people please keep busy so that you don't have to actually slow down to really let the full experience settle in? And then it's like, okay, now I know it's what I do, what, what's happening. How can I take steps to work through that? Grief and loss. We can't talk about um, what it means to be resilient people in this, um, you know, parenting kids with extraordinary needs without recognizing that there's going to be some grief and loss in that parenting experience. The loss of what could be longing for understanding or meaning or longing for what you now know will never be and feeling lost. So constantly attempting to reorient yourself to your world, right? And what that means. This disenfranchised grief over layered on it when we don't have um, the space or the ability to mourn the loss that we've experienced as parents, it's not socially sanctioned. It's not openly acknowledged. It's not recognized by others. That greatly decreases our opportunities to heal from it. And so understanding that um, this is an added layer for parents of kids with extraordinary needs. And if we, again, offload these emotions, deny them, <laughs> don't recognize this as part of this full experience, it's going to take its toll on our nervous system, which will lead to more dysregulation um, because of that nervous system um, not being strengthened and cared for in the way that, of course, we would all hope that we could do, okay? 
The other piece is the trauma experience. There's studies that have been done. Um, the body keeps score is one of them about what trauma does to the nervous system. Um, there have been studies that have been done about cortisol levels in the um, cortisol levels from parents of kids with special needs, cortisol levels from veterans who are returning from um, combat. And there's been, there's no identifiable difference in the cortisol levels of those two populations. And the reason why I say that is because I want you, if you have experienced trauma in your parenting experience to recognize how significant that is, right? We would never say to, for example, a, um, a soldier returning from combat, like, oh, it's okay, you'll be fine. Oh, you probably, you don't need to get help for that. It's, it's gonna pass, don't worry. You should be able to just kind of get through it yourself. You're gonna be fine. We would never say that. Their experience has been so traumatic, right? So to be able to think of your experience again, if trauma is a piece of that, um, with that same sort of weight, right? And what is it then um, that that requires in order to move through it so that you can come out this other end more resilient and have that strengthening of the nervous system as a result. Some symptoms experienced as a result of trauma. There's just a few there. That hypervigilance is like always being on edge, knowing that you don't need to be hypervigilant on edge, but still not being able to relax anyways, right? And then there's lots of reasons why um, the trauma is compounded. A lack of sleep, if that's part of your child's differences, they don't sleep as well as you would hope they would. So your lack of sleep, um, you have a lack of sleep as a result, the medical system, right? Not being believed, not getting what you need, not feeling like you have the support in that medical system that you need. School experience, not having teachers, administration on board, isolation, and then poverty and discrimination on top of that. So listening to your nervous system, if you have, um, if those, those are just a few, again, of the, the big pieces that I see in working with parents and what can cause that instability in their nervous system, a chipping away at their resilience, their then um, decreased ability to maintain their regulation. Um, that we start here, listening to your nervous system. What is your body telling you? Reconnecting with your body. As I said, many of us are disconnected with, from our body until we um, start making a conscious effort to listen to it. And it will tell us first. <laughs> our, our body keeps score and it tells us first what's happening at that physiological level. And then listening to your mind. I've talked a lot about this with the mantras and that sort of thing. Um, but where do you notice those first signs of agitation or anger, feeling confined or smothered, on the verge of tears, feeling out of control, right? Doing work outside of the moments, five minutes most nights, right? Not even every night, but five minutes most nights to just reflect on these things so that you can start to see the patterns emerge. And then you know better where to, um, the points of support may be needed, right? In your own life to gently work through whatever there is to work through and strengthen your nervous system. So acknowledging the intensity and the full impact of your experience, being able to take gentle steps to heal um, with the support of a community or a professional, if you feel like that's what's needed, providing yourself with grace and self-compassion. We didn't talk about self-compassion. I did in that other webinar that I referenced earlier, but it, there's research that's been shown that it is a protective factor against anxiety and depression. Um, so it is, um, it is very powerful. And when parents don't know where to start in terms of building their resilience, I always encourage them to begin with self-compassion and different self-compassion practices. I'm gonna show you um, on the next slide, a resource where you can find more information about that. Breathing, again, I said breath work is completely underrated in terms of how it will downregulate our nervous system. You can do it when nobody knows you're doing it <laughs> in moments a day, right? Begin there. That's all you can manage. That's okay. That's a start. Focusing on the big three, movement, sleeping, um, fueling your body. Um, again, I talked about the intentional reflection and then finding spaces that provide you with empathy, that provide you with co-regulation, that will strengthen your nervous system, just like it strengthens your child's nervous system, right? And connection. So making sure that the communities that you're spending time in provide you with the buffer, <laughs> right? That they're not those triggering influences for you. Your time is too precious. Your energy is too precious. 
All right, and here are some resources. So I mentioned Dr. Mona De La Hook. There's the title of the full title of her book. She just came out with another parenting book that focuses on this brain-based approach and neuroception, faulty neuroception, regulation, all of that. I haven't looked at it yet, but her work is so good. I'm sure it's wonderful. It's getting great reviews. Dr. Kristen Neff, um, she is a researcher on self-compassion. So there's her um, website and there's um, audio um, like podcast, audio meditations that she takes people through. There's a book there. She actually has a child with autism, which I didn't know till recently. So talk about understanding um, a unique parenting experience. Dr. Stephen Porges, um, this, I mentioned him with neuroception, faulty neuroception, the polyvagal theory. Um, all of this work comes from his research. Dr. Stuart Schenker, he wrote the book there, Self-Reg, How to Help Your Child and You Break the Stress Cycle and Successfully Engage with Life. Very focused on all the topics we've been talking about tonight. And then Mindful, it's a website about mindfulness, if that's something that resonates with you as well. All right, I will stop sharing my screen now. Hi, Eileen. Thank you so much for that presentation. I, I know You're this welcome. is going to really be an amazing resource for our families. Um, this is such an important issue for SMS families, and I really appreciate you sharing with the prisons community. Um, so, awesome. I mean, and this is just such a wonderful description and understanding of what happens in an SMS household. I really, I really enjoy it. I can't wait to try um, all of these techniques. Um, so before we move on, uh, we have some, to our question and answer portion of our webinar, I'd like to introduce you to two very special people. Callie is our regional rep from Australia and her daughter, Emily. I'm going to share a quick video. Hello, everyone. This is Emily. And I'm Callie. And we live in Melbourne, Australia. And Emily was diagnosed when she was three years old with Smith McGinnis syndrome. And how old are you now? 16, 17. Ne nearly 17? 17. Nearly 17. So when Emily was initially diagnosed, her pediatrician sent us pretty much immediately to the prison's website. Um, she knew we'd be Googling, she knew we'd be trying to find all the information we could. And she said that this would be the most accurate, comprehensive and, and really appropriate information at the time. So PRISMS not only gave access to the latest research and studies, um, but probably more appropriately, it gave us the information we needed at that time, at the time of diagnosis, um, which was giving us info a bit at a time that was targeted towards new families. So we didn't get completely overwhelmed. So it's basically become a hub to check in with Emily as she's kind of progressed through the different stages of life. Um, the medical management guidelines in particular have been excellent uh, to pass on to health professionals and uh, really educate them around what we need to pay attention to at a specific time um, as, as she's been growing up. As the PRISMS rep for Australia and also the chair of Smith McGuinness Australia. Um, I was lucky enough to get a chance to go to the PRISMS conference back in 2016, uh, which was absolutely wonderful because I'd met so many people over the years online and, and through the PRISMS uh, Facebook group and so forth. But this gave me the opportunity to actually meet people face to face and that was wonderful. Uh, the other great part of it is there was a whole bunch more information that we could gather either from the sessions or even from talking to other parents, uh, which I was able to bring back to our local community um, and our local families and, and provide them with additional information. So both Emily and I can't wait to get back to another PRISMS conference, hopefully in the next few years. Um, Emily hasn't been before, so I think you'd love, you'd love to go, yes? We're absolutely grateful for all the support that PRISMS continues to give our families. And uh, what, what would we like to say to PRISMS? Thank, Thank you, PRISMS. Thank you, PRISMS. Got it? Yep. And cut. Thank you so much, Callie and Emily, for putting that video together for us and for sharing your story with us. So now we have some time for um, some questions, Q&A with Eileen. Um, we've got a few questions, so we may not get to all of them, but we will try to answer as many as we can. So the first question that we have for you, Eileen, is um, how do you co-regulate when a behavior happens in an instant? How do you de-escalate the situation when it happens in a split second? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, great question. So um, this is, of course, going to, well, the first thing I will say, if, it, if, if safety is involved, of course, you want to take care of the safety and mitigate the safety risk first, right? That's the first and primary um, focus. But if it's, if it's challenging behaviors that aren't presenting a safety risk to the child or to anyone else around them, then it really depends on what helps your child, again, come back into their window of tolerance. So um, some of the things that seem to be pretty universal is us talking less, right? That auditory processing, I think talking agitation, that's what I kind of equate the two with many times with kids who are out of their window of tolerance, um, getting low and slow, like Dr. Mona Lake De La Hook says in her book. So if you can make yourself smaller, like sit even Indian, you know, sit it on um, cross-legged on the floor and even look at the floor if you're, that helps your child kind of come down. The key piece about co-regulation is you need to be in their presence. So if they are slamming the door and they're on the other side of the door, sitting outside the door, letting them know that you're there, right? But if that's going to help them calm down to have their own space, but you're right there um, to, to do that, helping them get their senses back engaged so they can feel grounded again, again, it's going to look different for different kids, but is that getting them a glass of cold water, um, getting them, you know, a snack, something like that, that will then again, help them kind of regulate. So it, in Dr. Ramona De La Hook's book, she actually has these worksheets that help take parents through all the sensory pieces, do it like a checklist to see what may work best for your child if you're starting completely from scratch. So that's another resource to consider in exploring that. Um, but usually less is more, right? Less is more. Getting quiet, um, getting still, getting lower in terms of body posture, um, demeanor, that kind of thing. Okay, I think you might have frozen for just a minute. I hope uh, I hope the video looks okay now and okay. we're um, broadcasting okay, but you froze for just a second on my screen. So you're back. Oh, no. <laughs> Hopefully we're both back, no problem. The internet. Uh, um, okay, so what, uh, another question for you here is what about external elements that work against co-regulation like loud noises and just other mm -hmm. environmental factors? Um, yeah, I don't, I, um, what about them, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I mean, I'm really glad that somebody asked this question because we can forget about those things, right? Those things are true. Those things are absolutely true, including what I see sometimes is if you are in a parenting partnership and one parent is the co-regulator for the entire household, it's not uncommon, right? And so even that other adult in the home is dysregulated themselves, right? And so that can be another element, like what do you do? Or if you have two kids who have fragile nervous systems who are always like this, like why is that, right? Because they have such fragile nervous systems, they can't even, they're constantly triggering each other. So I, I don't know what you can do about those things. I mean, there's gonna be varying degrees of um, power that you have over some of those elements. I think the first step is doing exactly what you did, recognizing that they're there and trying to mitigate them as much as you can. So that may look like you're in this really loud, crowded environment. Maybe your child's even having a lot of fun. They want to be there, but you can tell that they're getting completely amped up and dysregulated. Well, that situation is going to just trigger, 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 right? So taking them out into a quieter place, getting them reset, getting them back within their window of tolerance. I mean, that's a more obvious and easier to solve problem than um, like if you live in a very loud, chaotic neighborhood, for example. But I think it's recognizing it. And then what can you do about it, right? There's only so much that's in your power. Right. Very true. Okay. I have another question. Um, okay. Are you familiar with any teachers or aides that have tried to use co-regulation? Oh my gosh. Um, I train teachers in the power of co-regulation and um, once they get it, it is amazing to see what happens, right? Just like it is in the parenting piece too. Um, so I don't know of any teacher, researcher, expert who specializes in this, but the research is out there to support it in the education world. Um, so if that is an area you're interested in, you wouldn't have a hard time finding how it relates to schools and classrooms. The same themes that we've talked about tonight apply, right? It's just transferring that to a different environment. 
Great, thank you. Um, and someone did ask about Eileen's presentation, her presentation for our virtual summit and how to access that. And we put a link in the chat. So if you pull up the chat, it'll have a link to, you just go to prisms.org and then underneath the education tab is virtual summit tab. If you click on that, then you can access not only Eileen's presentation, but all of the presentations from the virtual summit. You can find them there. Okay, I believe that that is all the time that we have for questions this evening. And let me take a look here. So um, be on the lookout for an email from me with a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as a survey. Um, please take some time to fill out this survey because we would love to know how we did. Um, I hope you will join us on future PRISMS webinars and please make sure to follow us on social media, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel and join us on uh, join PRISMS if you're not already a member. Membership is free and it's the best way to stay up to date with all things SMS. And bear with me one second here. Okay, we've got our closing slide up here. Um, PRISMS is a nonprofit organization and all of our programs, including our webinar series are fully funded by our generous donors. So if you're interested in supporting PRISMS and the programs that it provides to families impacted by smith beginner syndrome, then please visit our website, prisms.org and consider making a donation. So this concludes our webinar and I hope everyone um, has a great evening. And thank you again so much, Eileen. I really enjoyed the presentation and I know it's gonna be such a wonderful resource for our prisons families. I appreciate you being here tonight. Oh my gosh, thanks so much for having me. It was wonderful. Thank you everyone and good night.